Well, a very good evening from me, John Shea, with you here on BBC Radio 3 this Sunday night. It's just after 8 o'clock, and time now for this week's Drama on 3. Cyrano de Bergerac by Edmond Rostand, one of the great romantic plays, in the celebrated verse translation by Anthony Burgess, adapted for radio by John Tideman and directed by David Timson. Kenneth Branagh takes the title role, with Jodie May as Roxanne, Tom Hiddleston as Christian, and John Shrapnel as de Guiche. We present Cyrano de Bergerac. <laughs> De Quichy. May I present the Baron de Neuvillette, <clears throat> Christian de Quichy. Enchanté. Enchanté. The Baron comes from Touraine. Really? Mm. Well, yes. A stranger to Paris. I've been here rather less than three weeks. I'm joining the guards. Then we will meet again. Quite a crowd in the theatre this evening. Indeed. Christian, I must go. What, but you Look, said... Baron, I came here to help you if I could, but it's pretty clear that the lady isn't coming. I'll be on my way. I have some serious drinking to do tonight. No, stay. Just a while longer, please. To nurse a flame like mine for a... a woman without a name? You'll know her. I'm afraid. Afraid she'll be coquettish, exquisite, afraid to speak and show my lack of wit. The smart new language they all speak and write eludes me. All I know is how to fight. A soldier conquered by two enemies of shyness and love. I must know who she is. Wait till she comes. She's bound to come. Monsieur Lignier! Ah, Monsieur Lignier! This is the man who lets you eat and owe if you're a poet, as I am. Um, have you seen Monsieur de Berzerac anywhere? The Prince of Pastry Cooks. Oh, really now? Quiet, you patron of the tarts. Ah. Oh. I allow that poets honour my establishment. On credit, he is a talented poet himself. <laughs> well, some have said it. Cracked, aren't you? Crazy about the art. Well, um, for an ode, he'll pay a rhubarb tart. Let's say a tart lat. And a song. A small Swiss roll. As for a play. Oh, the drama, how my soul seeks. Damp your oven, sir. Gatto and such buy him his theatre tickets. Tell us, how much it cost you to come tonight? Four fruit flans, six cream buns. Where is Cyrano? That man's not much of a theatre goer. Oh, but he's got to be here. He's got to be. Montfleury's performing. Cyrano has warned him, surely you know, to quit the stage on pain of his displeasure for a whole month. That is why I'm here. Where is he? This Cyrano, what is he? He's in the guards. But there's his friend, Le Bray. Huh? Le Bray, come over. What have you to say about this Cyrano business? I'm worried. You have every right to be, Le Bray. But why? Cyrano is a most extraordinary man. Exquisite. One of the world's prodigies. Poet. Fighter. Physician. Musician. Ah, his appearance, though, isn't that truly bizarre? Bizarre? Excessive, hyperbolic, droll, with his triple waving plume, his visible soul, six slashes in his doublet and his cloak, which the flashing scabbard hoists up at the back to make it like the tail of a barnyard cock. That is Cyrano de Bergerac. Cocky, insolent, Gascony proud he goes, flaunting that punchinello strawberry nose of his. A nose, gentlemen, that makes one feel like squealing. Oh, God, no, it can't be real. It must be detachable, is, I'm prepared to bet. But Cyrano's never been known to detach it yet. He wears it, or it him. And, should anyone laugh, his sword swoops down and lops him clean in half. That blade is one of the blades of Destiny's scissors. But he doesn't seem to be coming. Oh, yes, he is, as sure as my name. He'll be here in a minute or so. I am prepared to bet a Poulet Ragno. <sighs> oh. mm -hmm. Look at her. Ah, one. Perfectly beautiful. A strawberry mouth in peach flesh. So fresh, so cool. She'd give one cardiac rheumatism. Look, there she is. Oh, so that's the one. Yes, yes, yes. Who? Tell me. Oh, my knees are knocking. Second name, Rubin, known as Roxanne. Though christened Madeleine. Roxanne. Roxanne, really, you know? 
Alexander's mistress? Alexander? Oh, wait! He is dead! He's safe. He used to be called the Great. She is delicately reared and bookish. Bookish? Oh, no. Still single, an orphan. Cousin to the Cyrano we were talking about just now. Who's that with her? Uh, that's the Comte de Guiche, complete with such blur. Totally smitten with her, but irreparably wed to the niece of none other than the Cardinal Richelieu. Mm -hmm. If he can't marry Roxanne, he proposes to hitch her instead to a certain unpleasant Viscount. Mm -hmm. And there he is, Valver. <sighs> the Viscount is mm, complacent. So de Guiche will push in there, if you catch my meaning. She comes of the bourgeoisie, and de Guiche could unleash, if he wished, such concentrated hell as to make her wish she'd never been born. Ah, well, I wrote a little song about him, showing up his piggish Machiavellianisms. I'll sing it. Let's get it over now, once and forever. Who? This Viscount de Valver. Idiot. Small stuff like you, he'll eat you in canapes. Stop it. And see, she's looking at you. Oh, heavens, it's true. At me. At me. God, she's looking at me. So, me and my thirst, we'll be the ones to go. No, Cyrano. I can't understand it. No. It's possible he hasn't seen the playbill. I hope that's so. He keeps quite a court, De Guiche. Boiling air. He's not got more than an hour to live. He wrote a song attacking De Guiche, who's sending along a hundred men to get him. A hundred men? Against one poet? Oh, to have to leave just when I found her. Him, her, she, he. Liniere comes first. Where the hell will he be? Fleury comes on now. He starts it off. It's very odd. No, Cyrano. Oh, I've lost my bet. Thank God. Ah, from the court and city. Ah, how good to breathe the incense of the verdant wood. While cool, harmonious breezes seem to say, ah, Cool, I ordered you to stay away. <laughs> it's him! God help us all. Alone, baboon, buffoon. For the space of one revolving moon, I ordered you to rest. You hesitate? Get off that stage. A bleat, a bray. Do any of you have anything to say? Don't let him intimidate you, Montfort. <coughs> Far from the court and city. Ah, how good! Wood. You see this stick, you clown? I'll plant a wood, splinter by splinter, over your rich terrain. <laughs> Far from this sort and kitty! Yet again, you disobey! Please help me, gentlemen! Carry on acting! Not for four more weeks. One word more and I lambast his shivering cheeks. All four of them. Oh, yeah. Enough! Stay in your stalls, you vaccine marquises. Your mooing calls my cane to rummage through your folderols. Continue, mon fleury. Discontinue, rather, unless he, unwilling to retire to sty or troth, needs disemboweling and his jowls cut off. Off, off, you awful! Lug your guts away, you mortadella! <laughs> Very well, then, stay, and I'll remove you, slice by slice. Monsieur! In insulting me, you insult the tragic muse. Yeah. <laughs> if the tragic muse had the dubious honor, fat sir, of your acquaintance, she would not abuse her pious duty, seeing the blubber ooze into your collar and your belly round as a clock. She'd kick your buttocks with her tragic sock. Come on, yeah. Godfrey, let's hear the play. Consider my poor scabbard, please, I pray. She loves my sword and wants my sword to stay inside her off that stage. I'll clap my hands three times, you moon of a man. Eclipse yourself on the third clap. Ready? One! I... I... Don't leave! It seems...
comes to me Ooh. on mature consideration. Three. Let him if he dares. Monsieur de Bergerac, this is irregular. I demand a few words from the head of the company. Gentlemen, no one hardly knows what to say. Monsieur de Bergerac, what are your reasons, sir? Why do you show such enmity towards Montfleury? Fellows, I have two reasons, but let one suffice. This Montfleury of yours is a deplorable mouther, grunter, grimacer, posturer, who tears his lines to shivers with a tinny voice like a randy cage full of white mice. <laughs> the second reason, that's my secret. How about all the cash we have to get back? Fellows puts us all right. Yes, money matters. Let it never be said that Bergerac wished to see Thespis's robe grow full of cash. Matters. Take that. Take off. If you'll guarantee a sack of loot like this, I'm ready to guarantee to let you shut the theatres every night. All right. All right. Let's clear the hall. You're mad, sir. Mad. That very famous actor has his grace the Duke of Kondal as protector? Do you have a patron? No. No patron? No. No patron to protect you with his name? No, for the third time, I'm protected just the same. My sword is my patroness. You'll have to go. You can't stay here in Paris. No? Great God, his great... Don't you know how long an arm the Duke possesses? Less long than mine when I've screwed on this steel extension rod. You honestly think you're able to do him harm? It's possible. He's a bit of a bore, that Bergerac. A braggart. Who should it be, you or me? It's in very bad taste, Diggish. Only a pig of a plebeian would sprout a snout like that. <laughs> so may we leave it to you, de Valver? Yes, you can leave it to me. <clears throat> that hmm? nose of yours is big, what? Very big. Uh... Nothing more? Just a fatuous smirk. Oh, come, there are fifty score varieties of comment you could find if you possessed a modicum of mind. For instance, there's the frank, aggressive kind. If mine achieved that hypertrophic state, I'd call a surgeon in to amputate. The friendly. It must dip into your cup. You need a nasal crane to hoist it up. The pure descriptive, from its size and shape, I'd say it was a rock, a bluff, a cape. No, a peninsula, a picturesque. The curious, what's that, a writing desk? The gracious, are you fond of birds? How sweet, a gothic perch to rest their tiny feet. The truculent, you a smoker, I suppose. The fumes must gush out fiercely from that nose. And people think a chimney is on fire. Consider it. It will drag you in the mire, head first, the weight that's concentrated there. Walk carefully. The tender-hearted swear they'll have a miniature umbrella made to keep the rain off or for summer shade. Insolent. Quite a useful gadget, that. You hold it high and then hang up your hat. Emphatic. No fierce wind from near or far save the mistral could give that nose catar. Impressed? A sign for a perfumery. Dramatic. When it bleeds, it's the Red Sea. Naive. How much to view the monument? Speculative. Tell me, what's the rent for each or both of those unfurnished flats? Rustic. Nay, George, that ain't no nose. Why, that's a giant turnip or a midget marrow. Let's dig it up and load it on the barrel. The warlike train it on the enemy. Practical. Put that in a lottery for noses, and it's bound to win first prize. And finally, with tragic cries and sighs, the language finally wrought and deeply felt. Oh, that this too, too solid nose would melt. That is the sort of thing you could have said. 
if you, sir moron, were a man of letters or had an ounce of spunk inside your head. But you've no letters, have you? Save the three required for self-description, S.O.T. You have to leave my worsting to your betters, or better who can best you, meaning me. But be quite sure, you lesser feathered tit, even if you possessed the words and wit, I'd never let you get away with it. Come away, I can't leave him. Arrogant. Base non-entity without even a pair of gloves to his name, let alone the ribbons and lace and velvet that a man of breeding loves. I'm one of those who wear their elegance within, to strut around and dance and to prance, got up like a dog's dinner. That's not me. Less of a fop than you, sir, I may be, but I'm more wholesome. I have never wandered abroad without my insults freshly laundered, or conscience with a sleep picked from its eye, or honour with unragged cuffs. Why, my very scruples get a manicure. When I walk out, I like to be quite sure I smell of nothing but scrubbed liberty and polished independence. You will see. My soul, a ramrod, as if corseted. And as for ribbons, all I ever did, brave and adventurous, flutters from my clothes, with spirits high, twirled like mustachios. Among the false and mean, I walk about. And as for spurs, I let the truth clash out. Cad, villain, clod! Flat-footed, bloody fool! And I'm Cyrano Savigny Hercule de Bergerac. There! <sighs> hmm. Would you be terribly bored if I composed a poem? Poet? Huh? My lord, I'm thoroughly versed in churning verses out, even while rattling ironware about. I'll improvise a ballad. A ballad? Oh, sorry, my lord, to baffle you with hard uh, technical expressions. I'll explain. Three eight-line stanzas and then one quatrain, the envoy. Sir, thus my proposal goes to fight and at the same time to compose a ballad of strict classical design and then to kill you on the final line. Oh, no. No. Ballad of a fencing bout between the Bergerac and a foppish lout. Well, when you've finished your... Doggerel recital. That was no doggerel. That was the title. Wait. <clears throat> Let me choose my rhymes. Ape. That's one. Eel. Thank you, Ragnar. Ape, rape, grape, shape, feel, meal, deal, seal. Mm -hmm. I'm ready. I bare my head from crown to nape and slowly, leisurely reveal the fighting trim beneath my cape. Then finally I strip my steel, a thoroughbred from head to heel. Disdainful of the rain or bit, tonight I draw a lyric wheel, but when the poem ends, I hit. Come and be burst, you purple grape. Spurt out the juice beneath your peel. Jibber and show, you ribboned ape, the fat your falderols conceal. <coughs> <coughs> Let's ring your bells, a pretty peal. Is that a fly? I'll see to it. <laughs> ah, soon you'll feel your blood congeal, for when the poem ends, I hit. <laughs> I need a rhyme to hold the shape. Gape, fish, I'm going to wind the reel. My rod is lusting for its reap. This sharp tooth slavers for its meal. There, let it strike. <clears throat> ah, did you feel the bite? Not yet. The vultures sleep until the closing of the deal. The poem ends, and then I hit. Prince, drop your weapon. Humbly kneel. Seek grace from God in requisite repentance. Now I stamp the seal. The poem ended, and I hit. <laughs> Phenomenal! Quite mad. Heroic! Sir, I should be more than glad if you'd accept the homage, sir, of one who knows style when he sees it. Oh, well done. Lebre, that gentleman, who is he? D'Artagnan. Come on, Sir Renaud. Let's talk. Will you have dinner? Me? No. And why not? No money. I see. Every sou you go. Oh, shall we say, one glorious day of life for a month's pay. And how will you live the month out? I don't know. A stupid act. A marvellous gesture, though. Listen. Those jingling fops with their bellicose airs are starting to twist and torture your ideas of gentlemanly behaviour. Can't you 
understand. Your enemies are multiplying. The latest figure is... Excluding women? Forty-eight, by my count. Enumerate. Oh, Montfleury. The Viscount. Well, his relics, I mean. The author's friends. That frightful de Guiche, of course. The Academy. Delightful. This life of yours, where would it lead you to? What system is it based on? Bumbling through in aimless complication, forced to play too many parts. That was my old way, but now... What? I'm going to take the simplest approach to life of all. Simplest and best. Best is the word. I've decided to excel in everything. Ah, I'll let that pass. Now tell me, please, the thing I really want to know, your true reason, true, mind... For this show of hate for Montfleury. That paunch, that moor, too fat to scratch his navel with his paw, believes he's a sweet danger to the ladies. Why, even when mouthing tragedy, he's made his frog's eyes into sheep's eyes of fat lust. I've seen him, and I've choked down my disgust. Until one night, one victim that he chose. <coughs> a slug slithering over a white rose. One lady. Yes? I was in love with... No, God knows I am in love with... But you never said one word. How could he know? How could anyone? Absurd, isn't it? This nose precedes me everywhere. A quarter of an hour in front to say, Beware, don't love Cyrano, to even the ugliest. And Cyrano now has to love the best, the brightest, bravest, wittiest, the most beautiful. Beautiful. France cannot boast, nor Europe, nor all territories beyond. A girl more lissom, gossamer, fine, more blonde. Blonde? My God, who is this woman? She's a mortal danger without knowing it, undreamed of in her own dreams exquisite. A rose-leaf ambush where love lurks to seize the unwary heart. The unwary eye that sees her smile, sees pearled perfection. She can knit. Grace from a twine of air. The heavens sit in every gesture of divinity. She's most divine. Oh, Venus, amorous queen, you never stepped into your shell. Diane, you never glided through the summer's green as she steps into her chair and then is seen gliding through dirty Paris. There's no ban on uttering her name. Your cousin's name? It rhymes, and that's enough. Let not the shame of the dusty air besmirch it. Oh, absurd. This is the finest news I ever heard. You love her? Fine, so go and tell her so. Tonight you're covered in a golden glow of glory in her eyes. This gross protuberance. Look at it and tell me what exuberance of hope can swell the rest of me. I'm under no illusion. Oh, sometimes bemused by the wonder of a blue evening, a garden of lilac and rose, letting this wretched devil of a nose breathe in the perfume, I follow with my eye, under that silver glory in the sky, some woman on the arm of a cavalier, and dream that I too could be strolling there, with such a girl on my arm, under the moon. My heart lifts, I forget my curse, but soon, suddenly, I perceive what kills it all. My profile shadowed on the garden wall. My friend, I... My friend, why should providence allot such ugliness, such loneliness? You're not crying. Oh, never, never that. To see a long tear straggling along this nose would be intolerably ugly. I wouldn't permit a crystal tear fraught with such exquisite limpidity to be defied by my gross snout. Tears are sublime things, and I... Wedding a nymph to a rhinoceros would render the sublime ridiculous. All right. Not crying, but still sad. Yet love is an imponderable, not a matter of, well, nasal mensuration. March right in! If love, as they say, is a lottery, you can... Ah, oh, I love Cleopatra. Have I Antony's glamour and glow and glory? And if she's hero, though I can swim, I'm no Leander. A new Roxanne needs a new Alexander. And I'm the great in only one respect. Helen of Paris, whom can she select but Paris of Paris? I'm not he. But your wit, your courage, they can earn love. I saw her face. Roxanne's. Tonight, during your duel, it was ghastly white. 
That skill, that courage got the girl. You're halfway there. Now, dare to speak. So she can laugh at this? Why, man, there's nothing that I fear more in this world. Monsieur de Bizarac, there's someone here who'd like a word with you. Hasn't a chaperone. I have a message. My lady says she'd be glad if her brave cousin, as she puts it, would be good enough to meet her in private, as she puts it. She wants to meet me. She has something to say to you, so she says to me. She's going to early mass tomorrow, Saint Roche. Mm -hmm. She wants to know where she can see you afterwards. Oh, uh, heavens, uh, let me think. Where? I, I'm, I'm thinking where, where, uh, at the shop of Monsieur Wagonot, the patron. Where? At the shop of, uh, in, in, in the Rue Saint Honoré. Seven o'clock, she'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be with her. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to see me. So, it's goodbye to misery. Whatever she wants, it means that I at least exist for her. So, now, an accession of calm. Calm, with ten hearts beating within, each arm as muscular as twenty. My arteries thud with thunder, lightnings jagging through my blood. I need an army, meet for my defiance. So take away your dwarfs. Bring on your giants, and we're off! Oh. 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 Thank God you're here! Quigley, what the de devil enough, this one? Lumiere! What's the trouble? I got this note! A hundred men because of a song I wrote! I didn't go home here. A hundred men going to get me armed! A lot of them! When I go through the pods now, it's my way home! Let me stay in your place. Hundred men! Going to get me. A hundred men. Tonight you lay your head on your own pillow, Linia. But the... I'll turn down your bed myself. I swear it. Now get off your knees <laughs> and take that lantern. You the witnesses of what I intend to do come to. But please keep a safe distance. You mean you're going to fight one hundred men? Certainly. Because oh. ye tonight... Less than a hundred would be far too few. But why protect this man, Linier? I expected you, Captain, to raise objections. This drunken sot is... This drunken sot, this claret, but this pot of mountain dew. <laughs> Once did a thing as pretty as ever I saw. It happened here in the city. Mass had just ended. He saw a girl he loved dip in the holy water ah. font. He shoved his whole head in and drank the blessed love. Ah. A lovely thing to do, was it not, sir? But a hundred men against one poor poet. Why? Don't, let's go. When I make for the enemy, don't help, no matter what the danger. Alone I'll go, save for this triple-waving plume, this proud panache. Nobody must presume to aid me in this fight. My fight, my war. Oh. Uh, one question, why do five-score enemies seek to stick five-score daggers in the back of one poor poet? Answer, it's because they know this poor defenceless rhymer is a friend of Cyrano de Bergerac. To the Pot de Nel! To the Pot de Nel! Frigid muse departs. There, dawn is silvering each casserole. So lock the god of poetry in your soul. Oh. Quit cool Parnassus for there's another fire. The ovens beckon. Au revoir, my liar. 
What time is it? It's near seven o'clock. On the hour. Felicitations. Ah, oh, such skill, such power. I saw it all. Saw so what all, good Ragnar? You're a duel in rhyme. I talk about it all the blessed time. Oh, that. The poem ended. And I hit such a synthesis of steel and style, such tricks, such tropes. Uh, the time? It's 59 past six. The rhyme and rapier is wonderful. Uh, the poem ended. And I... Oh, 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 oh. Here. Where and when did you get that wound? That's only a scratch. Uh, I'll, I'll patch it. I'll get some ointment. It's nothing. I tell you, listen, I have an appointment here soon. Leave us alone, will you? Alone? When I give you the signal, just go away. The time? Ah, uh, two ladies at the door. One masked. Oh. I'll go inside. It'll be less distracting. For the muse, that is. So, out this letter comes. If I can see the faintest wisp of hope. Uh, madame, a quick word. Do if you like, monsieur. Are you uh, by way of being a gourmand? I can do the gourmandizing act until I'm sick. Good. I take a Pindaric ode or two, hey? uh, making the subject matter chocolate eclairs. Ah. Do you like cream puffs? So long as there's more cream than puff. This ode looks puffy enough. Mm. As for this epic on a lovesick soul, it's deep enough, I think, for a whole jam roll. <laughs> Go and come you, madame, with the rising sun. Masticate thoroughly. Don't come back till you're done. <laughs> May that one hour of all the hours be blessed when you at last remembered I exist and came to tell me... what? First, I must thank you for last night. Oh. That wretch, that fop you punctured, his patron is eaten up with what he calls love. The Guiche? The Guiche proposed that I should marry. A blasphemous disguise for his own... I see. That's one bad chapter closed. I fought not for my nose, but your bright eyes. The other thing is, I don't mention it yet. I must see you first as you were. The almost brother you used to be when we were children together, <laughs> playing in the park by the lake. How can I forget the summers that you spent at Bergerac? And when your swords were bull rushes. <laughs> and the golden hair of your doll was corn silk. <laughs> Heavens, how I'm taken back. And to when my wish was always your command. <laughs> Short-skirted Roxanne. You used to be Madeleine. Was I pretty? You were never exactly plain. I remember you'd climb a tree and hurt your hand and come running to me. And then I'd play the mother and I'd take your hand and say, Oh, how on earth did you manage to... Oh, oh no, how on earth? Oh. Let me see that cut. Let me see. Oh, even now, at your age. A bit of rather rough play with some of the big boys down by the Porte de Nel. Give me your hand. Yes, oh. Mama. <laughs> Playing indeed. Tell me, how many of these big boys were there? Oh, about a hundred. About a hundred? A hundred? Out with your story. Come now. Out with yours. If it is a story, if you dare tell it, yet. I do dare. Oh, how easily one conjures the scent of the past. <laughs> I'm breaching it, and you and I are home again. So listen now. I'm in love with someone. Ah. With someone who doesn't know, doesn't suspect. Ah. Not yet, anyway. Ah. But he will know soon. He loves me too, but so far from a distance, timidly, poor boy, too scared to speak. Ah. Can you say nothing but ah? Ah. <clears throat> Give me back your hand. Oh, how hot it is, feverish. Oh, but I see love trembling on his lip. Oh. He's a soldier, and more than that, he's in your regiment. Oh. And more than that, even, he's in your company. Oh. Oh, and such a man. Oh, intelligent, young, oh. proud, brave. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful? Whatever's the matter? Nothing. Just this fool of a scratch I got from the big boys. Anyway... I love him. All that remains for me to say is that 
I have only seen him at the theatre. Never met? Never uh, spoken? Only with our eyes. Then how can you know? Well, how you know how it is. People talk in the Place Royale, gossip as they walk under the lime trees. He's in the guards, you say? His name? Baron Christian de Neuvinet. He's not in the guards. Oh, yes, he is, as from today, under Captain Carbon de Castel Jaloux. So soon, so fast, the knife can pierce our hearts. My poor dear child. Monsieur de Bergerac, I've eaten every single one of those tarts. Good. Now read the wrappers, front and back. Front and back. Uh, my dear sweet child, think, consider, you, who love fine words, eloquence, elegance, he, he may be a fool, a savage. Oh, but his curls are the curls of a Greek god. There's a chance that his brains may be curly too. That can't be true. My woman's instincts tell me otherwise. Those instincts often tell the biggest lies. Suppose he's a boor, a bore, what will you do? Well then, I suppose I shall have to die. And so you brought me here to tell me this. Perhaps you'd be good enough to tell me why. Yesterday, someone said, oh, it frightens me. Somebody said that all your company are Gascons. Yes, all Gascons. Ah, I see. It's a matter of our fiery Gascon pride to rip up any greenhorn from outside who gets inside. Is that what you heard? I'm scared for him. Not without cause. But you who dared so much last night, that brute, those brutes, everyone is so scared of you. I thought... Your Christian shall not be thrown to the lion. For our friendship's sake, you'll protect him, defend him. You'll make him your friend. There's nothing finer than friendship. Promise. I promise. Oh, don't let anyone fight duels with him. God forbid. Oh, Cyrano, I love you. Tell me everything about last night sometime, won't you? Now, I have to go. Oh, how I love you. Oh, and tell him to write. Yes, yes. Oh, don't forget now. Oh, just think. A hundred men against my boy of the bulrush sword. Oh, when there's time, you must tell me. We're friends, aren't we? Yes, yes. Turn to write. Oh, you and a hundred men! <gasps> Such courage! Farewell. Farewell. I've done better than that since then. May I come in? Yes. Yes, you love me. What? Captain Carbon. Lebrun. We've heard the story, but we want it from you. There are 30 cadets of the guards all ready to get you drunk in the tavern across the way. Come on! I'd rather not. Serrano, the whole of Paris is out looking for you. A delirious crowd awaits you, led by the ones you led along last night. I trust you didn't say where they could find me? I did. Oh, no. How about Roxanne? Quiet. It seems the Comte de Guiche has found you. I have a message from the Marshal who wishes to convey his necessarily impartial felicitations on your flamboyant bravery. I respect his judgment, Comte. He was incredulous until the testimony of so many gentlemen convinced him. What's the matter? Quiet, Lepre. You look as though you're suffering. What did she say? No. This incident at the Porte de Nel is, I hear, one of many notorious, glorious, I'm told it's not easy to tell. You're one of these wild Gascons. That is so. Those hairy, head-high heroes. The famous, infamous... Gascony cadets. Cyrano, tell him. Captain Carbon Castel Jaloux, I obey your order. Go! Such are the Gascony cadets. Captain Castel Jaloux's their chief. Braggers of brags, layers of bets. They are the Gascony cadets. They're lithe as cats or marmosets, but never cherish the belief... They can be stroked like household pets, or fed on what a lap dog gets. They scorn the scented handkerchief. They dance no jigs or minuets. They cook their enemies on brochettes, with blood as their aperitif. Castel Jaloux, here is the chief of these, the Gascony cadets. Hmm. It's fashionable for a gentleman's retinue to contain a poet or so, so how would you like to join mine? I don't like retinues. Your performance in the theatre managed to amuse my uncle, Cardinal Richelieu. You know, I could, if you cooperated, do you a little good in that direction. 
I suppose, like everyone, you've written a play in verse? You're Agrippina. Here's your chance to get the thing put on. Take it to him. Oh, he's expert in the drama. Himself. Just let him, you know, reshape a scene, a character. He'll be happy to rewrite the odd line here, the odd line there. I might, if I thought of anyone's changing a single comma, didn't make my blood curdle. But when he likes a thing, he pays munificently. The golden ring of my own writing, lines that soar and sing through my brain and bones and blood is my best reward. You're proud, sir. Dangerously so. Dangerous to myself. I think not, my lord. To others, well... He'll be not too pleased with himself today, the scandal who hired the hirelings who waylaid this man. Does anyone know who it was? Why, yes, I do. I was the scoundrel. I don't use my own teeth for biting insolent poets. I leave it to hirelings to chew them up. Rather endentulous hirelings. Captain Castel I want my chair, my porters, now. As for you, monsieur. The chair and porters of Monseigneur Le Comte de Guiche. Monsieur, have you read Don Quixote? Read it, I've practically lived it. <laughs> Ponder on. The chair is here, monsieur. The windmill chapter. 91. If you fight with windmills, they'll swing their heavy spars and spin you down to the mud. Or up to the stars. <laughs> Cyrano, you've done it again. Stop growling. No, to be quite accurate, when a man has achieved an unprecedented ecstasy of excess, you can't say he's done it again. I did it on principle. Excess, you see, is not excessive when it's been conceived on principle. My success is achieved only by excess. Oh, if only you'd stop trying to be the Three Musketeers and Don Christ Quixote rolled up into one. You'd make your way. You'd wing up to the top. Up to the top? What would you have me do? Seek out a powerful protector, pursue a potent patron, cling like a leeching vine to a tree, crawl my way up, fawn, whine for all that sticky candy called success. No, thank you. Be a sycophant and dress in sickly rhymes, a prayer to a moneylender. Play the buffoon, desperate to engender a smirk on a refrigerated jowl. No, thank you. Slake my morning mouth with foul lees and leavings. Breakfast off a toad. Wriggle and grovel on the dirty road to advancement and wear the skin of my belly through. Get grimy calluses on my kneecaps. Do a daily dozen to soften up my spine. No, thank you. Stroke the bristles of some swine with one hand, feel his silk purse with the other, burn up the precious incense of my mother wit to perfume some bad bastard's beard. No, thank you. Best I should think it best to make a visit rather than make a poem. Relish the savour of stuffy salons. Seek condescension, favour, influence, introductions. No, 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 thank you. No, no, thank Thank you, but to go free of the filthy world, to sing, to be blessed with a voice, vibrating virility, blessed with an eye, equipped for looking at things as they really are, cocking my hat where I please, at a word, at a deed, at a yes or no, fighting or writing, this is the true life, so I go along any road under my moon, careless of glory, indifferent to the boon or bane of fortune, without hope, without fear, writing only the words down that I hear, hear and saying with a sort of modesty, my heart, be satisfied with what you see and smell and taste in your own garden. Weeds as much as fruit and flowers, if fate succeeds in wresting some small triumph for me, well, I render nothing unto Caesar, sell no moiety of my merit to the world. I loathe the parasite liana curled about the oak trunk. I myself am a tree, not high perhaps, not beautiful, but free. My flesh deciduous, but the enduring bone of spirit, tough, indifferent, and alone. Alone? Yes. Tough? Yes. But indifferent? No. An indifferent man, God knows, doesn't go around as you do, seeking enemies. And you make friends? With all deference, is that gift not rather a canine one? You grin at your big pack of friends, your lips tucked in like a hen's ass. You love new friends. I'm glad to make new enemies. Oh, this is... Mad? 
Call it my little foible to displease is my chief pleasure. I love hatred. He's my best friend who admits he's my worst foe. You've no idea how bracing it is to go marching upright against a volley of venom in the sight of bloodshot eyes of angry men, among the spit of bile and froth of fear, cooled as by rain by those gentle drops. My dear friend, you're indifferent. Who on earth can hate your guts? Your soft and warm and bland good nature. One of those Italian cowls, comfortable, loose, designed for softening the chin. Now, I've no use for anything but an iron collar full of spikes, made ever spikier by new dislikes. It makes me hold my chin up, walk erect, a Spanish fetter blessed with the effect of a French halo. Hate is not a prison. Hate is the god of day newly arisen. Hate is a heat that disinfects my soul. Hate is an archangelical aureole. I understand, my friend. Be bitter, proud, before your foes or the indifferent crowd. But tell me that she does not... Not so loud. Cyrano, tell us about this combat. <sighs> Presently. Come, Baron, join us. The story of this combat ought to be a good example for this new one here, this new pupped, unwiped whelp, this soft-boiled egg that's trickled down from Normandy. I beg your pardon. Pardon. One word in your ear, Monsieur de Nervillette. There's a subject we're too discreet to mention. It would be like talking about rope in a house where a man has recently hanged himself. What subject? Oh, you mean Cyrano? You violate a ban merely by using the word most dangerous. He cleft a man asunder once because he had a cleft palate and spoke through his... And... <laughs> if you want life's chronicle to be brief, you need do no more than take out your handkerchief. Captain Carbon, what ought a man to do when Gascons boast too much? He ought to show that Normans have their share of bombast too. Thank you, Captain. That's all I wish to know. Monsieur de Bergerac, tell us the tale of what really happened at the Porte de Nail. Very well. My version. There, then, was the enemy. Here, then, was I, marching towards them. Like a great clock in the sky, the moon pulsed out at me. But suddenly I saw pass a cotton-wool cloud across it, like an angel cleaning its glass. And night fell equally black on myself and my lurking foes. So black that a man couldn't see even as far as his... Nose. Who is this man here? The new man who came this morning. This morning? This morning. This morning? His name is Christian... Oh, Dumbledore. I see. <clears throat> Where was I? God knows. Mordius. A cloud over the sky, so black a man couldn't see even as far as his toes. And I marched along, reflecting that to save that base, a drunken poet taster, I might be spitting in the face of some great man, a prince, well able to have at me right in the Nose. teeth. But still, imprudently, I marched. Why, though, should I stick my Nose. finger in that pie? Was Gascon impetuosity a match for Parisian cunning? Could I, a Gascon, ever live down the ignominious running of my Nose. legs? But I said to myself, on, on, son of Gascony, be brave, do what has to be done. March, Cyrano, march. Then out of the porridge thick darkness came the first thrust and caught me a flick. On the nose. I parried and found myself. Nose to nose. With a hundred garlicky ruffians from whom such a stink arose. That your nose took fright. With my head lowered like a bull like charred. Nose to belly. Belly of St. Thomas Aquinas. Then I released the full flood of my boiling wrath. Screams of pain rang out. Then a sword came, and I responded, Snout! Out of here, you two, out of here! That's better. At last the sleeping tiger wakes again. Go on a break, Captain, and leave me alone with this man. Rissoles on your men, you raglo! Get a coffin ready! Christian... Come to my arms. Monsieur? You have courage. I like courage. I don't think I quite... I'm her brother. Whose brother? Hers. I don't think I quite... Hers. 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 Oh. My God. Her brother. Near enough. What they term a fraternal cousin. And she's... And she's... She... She's... 
Told me everything? Yes. She loves... She loves... She loves me? Perhaps. Oh, I'm overjoyed to make your acquaintance. This is what they call a change of heart. Forgive me. Please, forgive me. You're a handsome devil, no doubt about that. Oh, if you only knew how much I admire you, sir. How about all those noses? I take them back. Every single nostril. Roxanne expects a letter from you tonight. Oh, no. What? I ruin everything if I write. Oh. Because I'm such a damned fool. The way you tackled me was not damned foolish. Oh, I can find the words when mounting an attack. Call it military wit. But I don't know how to mount assault. The things to say. I mean, when it comes to a woman, I become paralytic, tongue-tied, speechless, dumb. That's explicit enough. If only I had the words. I have the words. All I lack is looks. You know her. I know her. Know that she's so exquisite, sensitive. One false word, and I blow any illusion she may have sky high. If only I had somebody like you as the interpreter, if I may put it so, of my dumb music. If only I had your wit, your eloquence. Well, your... why not borrow it? And in return, I'll borrow your good looks. There's promising algebra here. You plus I equal one hero of the storybooks. I don't think I quite... So I don't see why... I shouldn't give you words to woo her with. You give me... Call it a lie, if you like, but a lie is a sort of myth, and a myth is a sort of truth. No reason why Roxanne should be disillusioned. Let's start a fruitful collaboration. Oh, you frighten me. Well, what scares you is the thought of the time when she and you are alone and you cool down her heart with breath unwarmed by words. Well, have no fear. My words will be with you, glued to your lips. What do you say? I say what I said at first. I don't quite... Understand. Unsure about my motives. Simple. It's pure art. The finest lines of the dramatist are dead without the actor's partnership. One whole is made from our two halves. Your lips. My soul. I think I see. To you, it's not much better than a refined amusement. Still, I'm grateful. Oh, God, we have to start at once. The letter. You mean the letter. Here it is, completed. <clears throat> Except for the address. I don't quite... It will serve an exercise in poetic wit. Poets who have no mistress but their muse often do this. I could serve you up a plateful any time. What you must do is to use, to a solid end, these airy nothings. Here. The more eloquent for being <laughs> insincere. Provide a dovecote for these harmless doves. Will... These words fit her? Like a pair of gloves. But w she's a woman. It follows that she loves herself so well. She's ready to believe that this is for her alone. It began with Eve, that delusion of uniqueness. My dear, dear... <laughs> friend. Your friend. come to your house to see if our flawless friend's maintaining his sublime height of flight. Oh, my Christian. <laughs> he is beautiful, brilliant. I, I love him desperately. Brilliant? Oh, more brilliant even than you. I agree. I've never in my life known anyone who could say those little things so beautifully that are, are nothing and, and yet everything... <laughs> It's true that sometimes his muse expires into a sigh inexplicably, but oh, then she revives and he says, oh, he says such things. Really? Oh, you think, as most men think, that it's impossible for a man to be both bright and beautiful. Talks well, does he, about love and so forth? Yeah, for the last word in tenderness. Listen to this. <sighs> In your presence, such confusion grips my heart that it grows wordless as a kiss. If kisses could but wing in winged words, then you could read my letter with your lips. 
Oh. Not bad. Not bad. A bit overwritten, though. But listen to this. You know them off by heart. All of them. Very flattering. Oh, he's so golden-tongued, such a, a master of his art. Oh, I don't know. It's a sort of verbal mist, a rhetorical fog. A master. If you insist. Madame, Monsieur de Guiche is here. Quick, you, Monsieur Cyrano. He may put two and two together if he sees you here. Inside. Inside, inside. It's growing hard to hide our secret. He'll cut me down like a tree if he so much as guesses. My lady? Monseigneur? I was just leaving. Alas, I'm leaving too. For the war. Alas? This very evening. We've orders to besiege Arras. Arras? Arras. Tell me, does my leaving leave you as cold as it seems to do? Oh, uh, no, I... I find that this present prospect of leaving you leaves me quite desolate. Oh, did you know I've been promoted colonel? No. Oh, oh, brother. Yes, colonel of the guards. The guards? The guards. The regiment of that man who's big in words and <laughs> the other thing, beastly de Bergerac. I may, with luck, get some of my own back. Ordered to Arras. Under my command. Oh, no. What is it? Oh, the flower in one's hand is so suddenly depetaled. This wind, this war, disperses all its perfume. One loves, and then... You've never, never spoken like this before. Mm. You say these things now for the first time when I have to leave you. And you said just then something about revenge. Um, my cousin? Ah, uh, yes. Are you for him? Very much against. Uh... Tell me what you propose for Cyrano. Send him into the thick of the fighting. Well, you'll love that. I know what I'd do. What? I'll leave him here, with his precious cadets, kicking his heels. Oh, that ought to make him sick. Oh, while the rest of the regiment goes off and gets medals and wounds and things, I know him. If you want to strike at him, strike at his self-esteem. Oh, woman. Woman, only a woman could dream up a scheme like that. Oh, the cadets will chew their nails, but Cyrano will eat out his heart. <laughs> and you'll have your revenge. You love me then, a little. When you make my enemies your enemies, I'd like to see that as a sign of love. It could be the sign of a start. Ah, these are the orders for the companies. Signed, sealed, not yet delivered. And this is for the guards. I'll keep it. Serrano, so much for you, you battle-traveling swine. And so, you, too, Roxanne, you like to play your little game. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes I say to myself that you and I are two of a kind. But always, I'm mad about you. And now to find love trembling within you when I have to go, oof, it's intolerable. Listen, half a mile or so from here, in the Rue d'Orléans, the Order of Capuchins has its center of brotherly love. Their sleeves are wide enough to hide me. The regiment leaves for the siege tonight, but without me. One more day will make no difference. And later on, tonight, I'll come to you. Masked. Uh, I, I apologize for mentioning the word, but uh, honor? <laughs> Eyes, spies oh. will be watching if anyone should find out. Oh. Oh, the war, your duty, the, the good of your family name. A lot of nonsense. I have a more urgent duty, a greater good, to contrive the voluntary surrender of... Say yes. Say it now. No. Say it. Whisper it. My duty is to make you do yours, B but... Uh, Bless you for that, but. Uh, oh, no, you must go. Go. I, I must make myself make you go. I must order you to, to be my hero. So you can love. You can uh, truly love. Uh, well, when I tremble for the safety of a man, I may talk of, of love. And yet you say I must go. Uh, yes, in the name of love, my dear... Dear friend. Hmm. I go then. <sighs> this adieu means not an end, but a beginning. <sighs> Later then. Later, Roxanne.
<laughs> My dear, dear friend. Oh, say nothing about what I did just then. If Cyrano finds out I stole his war from him. Yes, yes. Uh, Cyrano. Roxanne. When Crystal comes to see me, tell him to wait. Wait? But don't you make him dissertate on a subject picked in advance? Subject? A subject. But, but uh, you'll be quiet. Um, as a wall, that's me. N nothing, no, uh, everything. <laughs> oh, whatever singing fantasies come unbidden to his brain on the subject of, uh, oh, naturally, love. Naturally, <laughs> love. <laughs> well, I'll tell him to overwhelm me with excess <laughs> to rhapsodize, be brilliant. Good. Uh, but shh, shh, shh. As you say. Not a word. Thanks very much. Shh. Totally unprepared. Heavens, yes. Shh. Monsieur de Bergerac, we're going in. Come on, madame. Christian. Cyrano. Come and have the lines thrown to you. I have your theme. All that you have to do, you lucky, 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 is to get your memory ready. This is your best chance yet to cover yourself in genius. Come on now, try to look intelligent. No. Well, there's no harm in trying to look into... Oh, <laughs> you mean... That's right, my friend. I'm feeling rebellious tonight. I'm tired. Yes, tired of borrowing your lines, your letters, saying what you tell me to say, dithering with stage fright. Oh, it was fine at first. It was like playing a sort of game. But now, at last, tonight I'm past all fear. Tonight I feel inspired with my own inspiration. I no longer doubt that she loves me. My own words crash out. Uh, limp out, trickle out. Come on. No, I'm not entirely an analphabetic sod. As you'll see, thanks to you, I've learned a lot. As I see. And... Though I can't yet make the verbal summits, I know enough to take, by God, a woman in my arms. Bravo! Oh, she's coming. It's her. It's she. Don't leave me, Sarno. You're on your own, monsieur. Good luck. And good night. Uh, Christian. Christian, you came. <laughs> the air is sweet. Evening has come. <clears throat> we are alone. This seat beckons. Talk. I'll listen. Shall we sit? I love you. So, your theme. Uh, embroider it. <clears throat> Weave gorgeous tapestries. Love you. Rhapsodies. I love you. So much. So much. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and then? Uh, and then? I would... I would be glad if you loved me too. Say that you love me, too. You offer skimmed milk when I ask for cream. <laughs> Tell me how you love me. Very much. Turn your theme into a loving labyrinth. Devote your discourse to the true platonic note. Oh, God, I want to kiss your, kiss your throat. Really? I love you. Oh, that again. Oh, no, I do not love you. Good. I adore you. Oh, this is too much. Oh, forgive me, Roxanne. I'm so in love, I'm growing stupid. I agree, and that displeases me as much as though you were growing ugly. Listen. Retrieve your scattered eloquence. Otherwise, leave. But I... I know, you love me. Oh, good night. Stay. Wait. Listen, what I have to say is... That you adore me. Good, now go away. A great success. Oh. Felicitations. For God's sake, help me. Ah, uh, no. I shall die here and now, if here and now I find no way to make her love me again. Heavens, you idiot. How do you expect me here and now to... Wait. Look. See? She's at her window. I shall die. Not so much noise. Die. Um... 
a cloudy sky. Yes, yes, will you? But to reinstate you will not be so easy still. We have to try. <clears throat> stand there in front of our balcony while I um, stand underneath and whisper the right words. But how do we start? Call her. Roxanne. Have a pebble or two. Oh. Was somebody calling? Uh, me. Uh, I. Who? Christian. So? I have to talk to you. You've nothing to say to me. Oh, please, please. It's clear that you love me no longer. Such heresies. Such heresies. Unjust Such slanders. unjust slanders. Oh, oh, you divinities, whose name is justice. Witness that I love more than mere words can bear the burden of... Better. Love. Love. But I have thought a quiet child discloses mood so intemperate and wild. She crushes my cradling heart. Better still. But is it not best to break that unruly will and strangle such a monster? Heavens, I've tried to commit that venial infanticide, but a tough atomy I thought to seize and crush turned out an infant Hercules. Good. Very good. His first act was to... His first act was to ride and rend two hissing serpents, doubt and pride. Quite excellent. But since you mention doubt... Why do your words come so haltingly out? It's as if your fancy suffered from, well, I... Gout? <laughs> Quick, this is getting difficult. Tonight you hesitate so strangely. Why? A good question, and my answer is, each word uh, gropes through the darkness looking for your light. If that were really so, my own words would limp just like yours. Come, try a less absurd explanation. Very well. Taste this. My heart is open wide. Your words can't miss so large a target. Or heavy with the honey of desire, it zigzags to the orifice of your tiny ear and buzzes blunderingly, seeking its way in, its wings a haze of love. Or should these not suffice, then finally, since your words fall, they yield to gravity... Mine have to rise and fight it. Am I so far above you still? So far I fear that one hard word could kill, crushing my heart like a stone. Oh. Then I'll come down to you. No! But I want to see you. Stand on that bench there. No! Oh, such a vehement no! What is the matter? To hold in my hand such exquisite joy... I dare not let go this precious chance to speak to you. Unseen. Unseen? A disembodied spirit, clean of the clogs of accident and decay. You see a cloak of trailing blackness. You, to me, are a white gown of summer. I am a shadow, and you the quintessence of light. How can you know what it means to roam this transitory meadow, sunlit through the darkness... If ever, oh, if ever I was eloquent. You were very eloquent. But you have never heard till now my true heart, truly speaking. This one night, it seems that I address your heart for the first time. The first time? Yes. Your very voice has changed. My heart's true essence is emboldened by this darkness to speak out. It is myself that speaks. Well, where was I? Oh, forgive uh, this confusion, which is to me a heap of rose petals, a fantasy of sleep so new and so delicious. New? To live a moment breathing your sustaining air, freed from the choking asthma of the fear that you might laugh at me. Laugh at you? Why? Because of the unworthiness of a fool, an insufficiency that seeks to clothe itself in a sunset of words. 
shatter them all, these tokens. Valentine hearts, arrows, the tinseled quiver, stale words, stale honey, sipped in finicking drops from tarnished, gilded cups. What are they worth compared to the wild urge that shouts, that beckons our bodies to plunge and drown in the wild river? But the soul, the spirit... You mean the petty rhymes wrung from what petty spirits call the soul... I have made enough of those for you at times when I did not dare to bear myself as now to the overwhelming torrent of the night with its panic perfumes. Oh, but poetry, you can't say that of poetry. Poetry, rhyme, a game of words. Ah, oh, love's too stark a force to tolerate such tinkling, such tinkerings. A moment comes... And God help those for whom it never comes, when love of such nobility possesses this shaking frame that even the sweetest word, the ultimate honey, stings like vinegar. If so, what? When the moment comes for both of us, what words will you say? In that most precious instant, I shall take all words that ever were, or weren't, or could, or couldn't be, and in mad armfuls, not bouquets, I'll smother you in them, oh God. God, how I love you. I choke with love. I stumble in madness, tread a fiery region where reason is consumed. I love you beyond the limits that love sets himself. I love. I love. Your name, Roxanne, swings like a brazen bell telling itself. Roxanne. Roxanne, in my heart's belfry, and I tremble. Roxanne, Roxanne, with each bronze, gold, silver reverberation. Listen, I swing down the rope to earth's level, to each small thing, trivial, forgettable, unforgettable by me, that ever you do or did a year ago. The 12th of May, it was at noon striking... You left your house with your hair dressed a different way, the former way not being to your liking. And you know how, when you've been looking at the sun, you see red suns everywhere, embossed on everything. So that solar flood of your hair blinded me and bequeathed an after-image of heavenly goldness touching everything with a royal touch. Yes. This is love. Love. The parasitic, heavenly host. A terribly jealous God has seized me with most wretched fury, and yet he seeks not to possess. He is only mad to give. Each glance of your eyes begets some new virtue in me, new courage. Oh, can you see this? Feel it? Understand? Do you sense my heart rising towards you in this intense stillness whose perfumed velvet wraps us close? This night I speak, you listen. Never in my most reckless, unreasonable dream have I hoped for this. Now I can gladly die knowing it is my words that make you tremble in the blue shadow of the tree, for it is true. You do tremble like a leaf among the leaves, yes, and the passion of that trembling weaves a spider filament that seeks me now, feeling its way along the jasmine bough. Yes, I do tremble, and I weep. And I am yours. I love. You have made me. Ah, oh, to die. Death is all I need now after this summit gained. I ask one thing. A kiss. What? Oh. You asked for something? Yes. Too quick, too soon. Well, you got her into this state. Why shouldn't I get some benefit? Yes, it's true. I did ask. Yes, it's true. I did ask. Uh, but I was too impetuous. I was hurled into it. But you ask no more than that. No more. No. Yes. No more is no more than a void and nothingness. I ask too much. I ask you now to rebuff my importunity. Why? Why? Enough! Be quiet, Christian. What are you saying? Myself. I was being angry with myself for going too far. I said, 
uh, be quiet, Christian. Uh, that was rude, I suppose. Uh, somebody's coming. Ah, I see who it is, a priest. Diogenes, back from the dead, looking for honesty? Uh, no, sir, the name is uh, Madame Robin. Oh, here's a damn nuisance. Uh, you seem to be on the wrong track. Go straight on and to the right. Uh, thank you, my friend. I pray for you. May grace and fortune attend your holy Cuculus. Cuculus. <coughs> your hood. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Get that kiss for me. No. That kiss for me. No. Nope. Sooner or later. I... Sooner or later. True. It has to be that labial conjunction. A historical necessity. Since she is beautiful and all unworthy, you glow in the perfume of the unearned unction made up of youth and strength and <clears throat> comeliness. But I must be the agent of her, yes. Has he gone? Are you there? Yes. We were speaking of... Uh... Yes. The word is sweet enough, and yet your lips are shy of saying it. If the word burns, then what is your presage of the thing itself? Fear should consume you, yet, after all, you've glided insensibly from mockery to a smile, from a smile to a sigh, from a sigh to a tear. Now slide from a tear to a kiss. It's but a heartbeat's distance from that to this. Oh, do be quiet. Come. You heard what you said. Get up there. Uh, Let our savour, our souls conjoined in our lips. Now, what in hell's name are you waiting for? I'm not sure, really. This is the right time. Here's your instant infinity. Your music of the spheres. Mount, you animal. It appears he's at his banquet. The banquet I prepared. Only to end as it's Lazarus. Still I'm spared. One crumb, I suppose, one wishbone. And this is the knowledge that it's my words that she kisses. And not his lips. So, let's be cheerful then. Oh, damn, someone's coming. It's that cappuccino again. Oh, there! Is it? Cyrano, is Christian up there by <clears throat> any chance? Cyrano? Uh, that cappuccino is here again. It's something for you, Roxanne. You'd best come down. Madame Robin lives here. I have it on very good authority. Roland? Uh, Robin. I thought you said Roland. Robin, Robin. I hear it wasn't very clear before. One letter can make a difference, not L, B. How did you know I had a letter? Oh, I see, a I letter? see. For Madame Robin. I'm she? A very noble lord gave it to me to give to you. And to Quiche. He dares. Well, he won't dare anymore, not now. Some holy matter, I don't doubt. I'm sending this by an old sheep-headed monk who naturally has not been told its content. I must see you tonight. I must. Father, this letter concerns you. Does it? Does it? So I'd better read it to you. Uh, very well, very well. It's, it's terrible. Come, my child. Mademoiselle, it seems his eminence, the cardinal, will have his way, whatever you say or do. That is why I send this note to you by a, a very holy, intelligent, discreet... Capucha, instruct him, please, to meet these my instructions, which are that he is at once in your house to perform the ceremonies of holy matrimony. Oh, oh this is tyrannical. Courage, daughter. His grace, the cardinal, demands the nuptials of you and Christian. I knew it. I knew he was truly noble, one who could not do a thing that was not holy, holy. Oh, this is awful. Daughter, resign yourself. I am resigned. Cyrano, the quiche will come, for God's sake. Hold him there. He mustn't enter before... Uh, how long will it take? Oh, 15 minutes, sir. You'd better make it five. In, in. I need fresh air. I also need to distract his lordship. Where? How? Ah, up here, in this tree. 
I shouldn't. I have my plan. Did that blasted capuchin deliver? Damn this mask. I can't see. Where did you fall from, may I ask? The moon. The moon? What time is it? Is he mad? What time, country, day of the month, of the year? Uh, let me... I'm dizzy, a day to be fucking... Uh, monsieur... A fell... I... A fallen... You wish to know where from? The moon, you said? The moon dropped like a bomb, and I don't mean that metaphorically. Uh, please. <sighs> what is this place on which I've tumbled like an aerolith? An aerolith? Allow me. Uh, no choice. Hurtling through space. Oh, my point of arrival. Where am I? Um, ah, that face. Black. Are you an oppressed colonial? This is a mask. Venice, a carnival. A lady is waiting for me. Ah, uh, now I know. Paris. Where else could it be? Paris. So, this is where the ethereal typhoon has dumped me. Um, what a voyage. Dust of the moon. Asteroid fragments cling like sleep to my eyes. Planet fur on my spurs. Blonde comet hairs on my coat. Allow me. Can please. you see the great bear's tooth mark in my calf? This bump on my thighs from the hurled water pot of Aquarius. You've no idea of the zodiacal fossil. I initiated. I fell into one of the dishes of Libra scales, and look, scales from the fishes, hard to scrape off. Grab my nose with your fingers, give it a squeeze, and it will spurt out pure milk, please. From the Milky Way! I broke a string as I glissaded over the lyre. Ah, you can be sure, there's a book in this, a perilous record of risks. I shall use these stars on my cloak as asterisks. What I want now is to know how I got up there. My special invention, yes? Mad. I've invented six techniques whereby to violate that blue virginity up there. Six? Six, let me specify. Mm. I strip myself as nude as a candle, place around that nudity a carapace covered with crystal vials of morning dew. The sun sucks up the dew and sucks me too. So, that's one. Another one. I escape from Earth in a ship of icosahedral shape, stuck with ten burning mirrors. They rarefy the air, the rare air lifts me, and I fly. Uh, two. Or I mount a machine forged in the figure of a grasshopper, activated by a trigger that sets off successive charges of saltpeter. I jerk off into space. What could be neater? Mm, sweeter. Three. Smoke always tends to soar. I fill a globe with smoke. And that makes four. Uh, this next may seem <laughs> fantastic. Bright Apollo, who rules the sun, he likes to suck and swallow <clears throat> the marrow of the oxen of the sun. I smear myself with that and swish, it's done. Eyes. Finally, monsieur, I sit or stand upon an iron plate and in my hand I clutch a magnet. This I throw and throw... The iron lurches after, as you know, I can do that indefinitely. Six. Which did you choose of these ingenious tricks to make your recent voyage into heaven? Not that I believe you. On number seven. And what's the seventh way? You're uh, going to see... Uh. Well, what? Well, can't you guess what's happening to me? No. It's nearly time, sir, for uh, high tide. Oh. The, the moon is calling. I must stand beside the ocean, uh, having wallowed in it first. Uh, my hair is dripping wet. The lunar thirst pulls at it. Then the rest of me I saw, free as an angel, as I did before... Tumbling to earth a quarter of an hour ago, the time, my lord, is up, and so... And so, a marriage has been celebrated. What? Am I drunk or something? That voice, it's, it's not... <laughs> that nose, <laughs> it is... At your service, Cyrano. You! He... Clever, mademoiselle. Baroness. You, monsieur, you did that well. You could have charmed a saint poised on the sill of heaven. You ought to write that book. I will. My lord, the knot is tied, you bad me tie. As I can see, you, baroness, bid goodbye to your paint-fresh husband. Bid good? Why? Your regiment leaves tonight, sir. Be so good as to report at once. You mean for the war? That's what regiments usually leave for, my lady. But you, surely, I understood the cadets were not going. They are and always were. Here is the order, Baron. Pray deliver it, sir. Oh, Christian. The wedding night is still a good way off. That thought disturbs me less than it should. Your lips again. Come on, enough, let's go. Oh, you don't know how difficult it is. I know. 
We're marching. Marching to the war! Take care of him, Cyrano. Keep him out of danger. All right, I'll try, but I can't really promise. Be sure he keeps warm and dry. As far as is soldierly possible. Keep him away from other women. Not even the odd little chap. No, and make him write to me every day. Every day, madame. I can certainly promise you that. Forward! March! Oh, damn that blasted insomniac musketry. To wake our men, they need to sleep exhausted as they are. Just the usual crack of Cyrano coming back home. Oh, who goes there? Bergerac, imbecile. Thank God, as usual, you're back. Not wounded yet? No, they've got into the habit of missing me. Risking your life before breakfast to post a letter. Mad. Not, of course, that there is any breakfast. What must be done must be done. I promised his wife, as I must call her, that he'd speak to her by post if he couldn't speak on the pillow. Pale as a ghost, poor devil starving to death. We all are. I know, but Christian shows it more than most. If only that poor child could see him. Still handsome, though. <laughs> what a mess. We're besieging Arras, and yet it's we who are doing the starving. Besieging Arras, yes. And all the while, his eminent gorgeousness, the Cardinal Prince of Spain, is besieging us. Well, perhaps somebody will get down to besieging him. Not funny. Our chances don't get any better, and yet you grin instead of looking grim. Risking your life every day to send a letter. You're unnatural. You, Lebray, I see, have uh, something on your mind. My stomach. We all suffer the same vacuity. But you seem to enjoy it. Good for the figure. I'm hungry. And so am I. The whole world's hungry, Carbon. You think only of yourselves. Aha! Uh -huh. I see Monsieur de Guiche is on his way. He makes me... Oh, not as much as he makes me. Sifre, you're not the only one. What with the lace collar on his corselet. Always the little courtier. Very much the nephew of the cardinal. Nevertheless, gentlemen, he's one of Gascony's sons. A Zero. counterfeit. <laughs> the real Gascons, us, are a bit mad. But he's a bit too sane. Rational. A rational Gascon's dangerous. He's pale. At least he shows that common touch. Oh, nobody doubts that he can feel the pain of hunger, just like us poor bastards. But those jewels on his belt make the cramps in his gut sort of glitter like the sun on ice. Mm. Do you want him to see you suffering? Get out your dice, your cards, smoke your pipes. Come on there, try and look as if you like this, fam, and I'll read this book. Uh, Descartes. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, black looks as usual, hey? I see your prospective resentment. Jealousy. <laughs> Your conduct under fire apparently doesn't compare with mine in any way. How many of you squatting on your haunches could do the thing that I did yesterday? Hmm? I lashed the Count of Bouquois out of Bapaume, pouring my men on his in avalanches. I charged three times. But you failed to bring home your white sash. <laughs> so it's already got around that story, has it? When the third charge beckoned and I was rallying my men, to my astonishment I suddenly found I was being thrust with a throng of fugitives into the enemy's lines. The Spaniard gives no quarter. I was in danger of being shot, so what did I do? Thought quickly. Got shot of the white sash that marks my rank, and thus, anonymous, inconspicuous, blank, escaped and rallied my own force. Ah, yes! It worked. From the brink of death to a crash of victory. What do you think, my friend, of that little display of resourcefulness? This. A man's white plume is his panache. His visible soul. Not a thing to lend or spend. It's the shining badge of his scorn of his enemies. But the point is, my device was a success. True, but an officer never resigns easily his privilege of being a target for the enemy. Your... Courage and mine differ in this, monsieur. If I'd been present at that heroic affair, when you dropped your sash, I'd have picked it up then and there and worn it myself. Always boasting. No. 
Lend it to me tonight and I'll lead the charge with your white sash over my shoulder. Ah, these large and vacuous Gasconards. You're safe, as you know, with that offer. Our intelligence understands that that sector still lies in the enemy's hands. And my sash lies on the river bank. The river is swept by their artillery. No one could ever reach that sash alive. Here is your sash. With my compliments, I found it on the river bank. <clears throat> Thank you. This bit of white will do very well to make a signal. A signal that, to tell the truth, I was hesitant about making. But now, gentlemen, no more hesitance. But look, look, there's a man there running away. And taking my signal with him. My pet Spanish spy. Spy? Yes. He tells his masters what I pay him to tell them. Oh, a traitor. I suppose so, but a very useful traitor. Now, what was it we were talking about? Ah, yes. You may as well know our marshal's plan. You might find it interesting. Last night, we saw an opportunity with reasonable luck of revittling the army. In silence, covered by a good black knight, the marshal marched to Doulens, where our supplies are. There's a very fair chance that he will reach them. But to be sure of getting back in safety, he's taken an exceptionally large force with him. A good half of our army is absent from the camp. Well, thank God the enemy don't know that. Oh, but they do. <laughs> they do. They're going to attack us. Uh, My spy, a very reliable and pliable spy who tells me everything, Ask me where I would prefer the Spanish attack to be made. As you will doubtless all have understood, the aim is to gain time. We're not sure when the Marshal will return. And to gain this time? Gentlemen, you will all be so very good as to lay down your lives. Would it be reasonable to call this, <clears throat> well, revenge? I won't pretend that I care the least damn about any of you. But since you all consider you're no end of fine, brave warriors, and <clears throat> this is hard to do, admittedly, leaving out the personal, you are the obvious choice. If you want that to mean I serve my king by serving my own spleen, I will not contradict you. Well, that's candid. May we offer our thanks? You, sir whose bliss is to engage a hundred single-handed, ought to be rather looking forward to this. Christian! Roxanne. I know. I should like to say goodbye to her and to put my whole heart... In a letter. I thought of that. Well, let me see it. Do you really want to? Why not? I am supposed to have written it. What? Yes. This spot. This... Little circle. To me, it looks very much like a tear. Oh, well, you know how it is. When a poet writes a poem, he is frequently moved by his own fiction. I admit, I've written a moving letter. I tried not to be moved, but I was moved. Just a bit. You mean to say you cried? Yes, I cried. And why not? Dropping a tear or two, this is... In the best heroic tradition, Ajax cried, Ulysses, Hector, to die, I suppose, is little enough, even to die in the hot morning of youth, but never again to see the one we love. Huh? That's horrible. And the horrible bare truth is that I never... We, 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 we never... And you, you... Gentlemen, look at that. What is it? A coat and horses. What? Here in the camp, the coachman's making signs. He's shouting something. On his majesty's service. Impossible. No. His majesty's service. What? The king? Hats off. A royal reception. Drums at the ready. Begin. Lower the step. Open the door. Good morning. Of oh, oh, You. The, the king's service? The one and only king. Love! Oh, God in heaven. You? Here? But why? The siege of yours has lasted far too long. I daren't look at her. You can't stay here. Why not? 
What a journey it's been. A patrol very rudely shot at my coach. It looks, doesn't it, as though it's been magicked out of a pumpkin, you know, Cinderella. Good morning again. Why so sad, all of you? You know, it's quite away from Arras. Cyrano, I'm terribly glad to see you. Oh, Roxanne, you'd better tell us how. I found your army. I can't tell it now. It's too long a story. But what horrors. Grey and murky battlefields. Corpses and casualties. If that's your king's service, mine's better than his. But this is madness. How did you get through? Didn't they ask you where you were going? Often. All I had to say when we were challenged was, I'm on my way to see my lover. They couldn't have been sweeter. They bowed and murmured, Vaya, senorita. Madame, you cannot stay here. You must go away. Quickly, too. You must. At once. Christian, do you want me to go? Just the small matter of a battle. Have your battle. I stay with my love, my husband. If he dies, we die together. This sector of the line, it's doubtful whether anyone can survive. And that is why he put us here. I see. You want me to be a widow? I, I swear I had no such... I swear I am staying here. Go while you can. No. Very well, then. Give me a musket. I am staying, too. Oh, <laughs> spoken, sir, like a man. At last you're showing Gascon fortitude. I don't desert ladies in danger. You hear that? It seems we've got a new recruit. He's one of us at last. My pikemen are lined up. Accoutred. Armed. Madame... Will you inspect them with me? Charmed. And coachman, give out the food we brought to all these hungry men. <laughs> Christian, what? Roxanne is going to speak not of a letter, but of letters. Well? Not just a few, a lot. The time has come to open what was hid. You wrote a great deal more than you thought you did. What? Look at it this way. I had the task of articulating for you. I didn't ask whether I should write or not. I wrote without mentioning it. When I assume a commission, I devote a sort of silent attention. In God's name, how? We're under siege. We're cut off totally. Oh, before dawn, it's easy enough. You see, I'm able to cross the lines. So, I see it now. I've written more than I thought. To be precise, how many times? Once a week, say, twice, three times, four? Yeah, rather more. Every day? Yes, every day, twice. I see. They say there's only one thing that will make a man mad enough to... Quiet! She's coming, and I am going. Roxanne. And now, at last, dear Christian. Now, at last... You can tell me why you risk... At last, I can. Blame your letters if I can speak of blame. That lyric flood from the battlefield. Not a day has passed without their burning up my day. A flame that blinded me at last to danger. So? Just for a bundle of love letters? Oh, no! You don't know your own genius. Oh, it's true. There once was an evening of jasmine, lilac, rose, when I began to adore you, but... Your soul arose in perfume to my window. The true you made itself known in a voice. But then, that voice sang to me every day. I had no choice but to come running. I read your letters, reread, re reread them, saddened by my unworthiness, but gladdened by the knowledge that you, like Jupiter, had descended to me. A hapless semele, your words all golden petals, the flower that shed them, your soul, a soul a fire with sincerity. The sincerity. That came across then. Oh, my cross is the cross of my stupidity. My soul sinks to its knees from which I know your love will raise me. But the heart that lies crushed by love's burden cannot be raised. It cries, forgive me, dearest. Let me veil my eyes in anguish. Tell me how I can atone for the sin that lies upon me like a stone. The insult of loving you for your beauty alone. Oh, heavens. Later, I learned, just as a bird learns how to soar, to feel my spirit stirred by the totality of you. Flesh and soul, loving the two together. But the goal of true love should be elsewhere. What do you love now? You! 
the essential you, the true, free being, hidden by the casual dress of flesh I loved you for at first. I didn't like this one bit. What I loved before was a mere bauble. Now I love a soul. I'd rather be loved as people usually are, with a bit of body as well. Here, then, the crux. Henceforth, I shall find distraction in your looks. Your beauty is a barrier to you. If you were ugly... Twisted, all askew, dwarfish, deformed. I feel I know I should be able to love you more. The greater good needs not the lesser good. It was good enough before. Tear off your beauty with a rough, rude hand. Learn an unwanted ugliness and see how my love shines. Ugly. Oh, yes, I swear it. Ugly. Leave me. Leave you? Just for a moment, I have some thinking to do. And you must warm my friends with a smile before they... Dear Christian, dear... Dear Christian. And so I know where I stand. You heard, Cyrano? Yes, I heard it all. She doesn't love me anymore. Stop that, Christian. It's you. She loves my soul. You are my soul. Too true. And you love her? I? I know. That, too, is true. Madly. More. Tell her. No. Why not? Look at me. Oh, yes. Ugly. Ugliness is what she wants. She wants me to be ugly. Yes, I heard. Can you blame me if I bless the thought? But you mustn't believe it. You must not believe she wishes you to... Let her choose. Tell her everything. Not this cross, this gallows. Cyrano, look at me. I'm a non-entity cursed with a pretty face. Must I destroy your happiness for that? And this mere trickery of words I have because of that? Go back with her. Love her. You deserve it. Joy, you deserve it. God, I'm on the rack with being my own rival. I want to be Come. loved for what I am. Comely and dumb. Or else not loved at all. Can't you see? Clever as you are, that basic simplicity. As for our marriage, that was a fraud. Clandestine, unrecorded, and dear Lord, unconsummated. Two beds, both cold. Get thee behind me, it will hold. Till doomsday, after. This whole discussion is academic. We're both going to die. No, you must live. As for dying, that's my duty now. For being obstinate. For what I am, or not at all, I'm going to see what's happening there. Talk to her. Let her choose. I know what her choice will be. And you... I suppose I can hope. Hoxan! Oh, no! What is it? Serrano has something to say. Important. I must get in line. Important? Oh. He's gone. I seem to have said something to upset him. I know what you said. Did you mean what you said? Don't be afraid of saying it to me. Even if you were ugly? Even if he... Ah, they've started. Uh, terribly ugly. Terribly. Twisted, deformed, grotesque. How could he be anything but noble, sublime, great soul? You still love him. All the more. God, is it possible after all? Possible. Roxanne, listen to me. Serrano! Serrano, the word. No! What? What's happening? I can never say it now. Finished. You were going to tell me something. Something, yes, whatever it was, doesn't matter now. Here's something new to tell you. Christian, this I swear, because it's God's own truth, was a great soul. Was? You say was? It's over. Lay him gently down. Christian? He was burst over the parapet. The first shot got him. Christian! Christian, hear me. I told her everything. It's you she loves. Oxen. Speak, my love. He's not dead. Speak, my love. My love. I feel his cheek cold against mine. A letter here for me. My letter. Roxanne, I must go. They need me. Just See? Stay a while. He said you were his friend. 
The only one to know his greatness. Yes, Roxanne. He was a great soul, wasn't he? Yes, Roxanne. Genius, nobility, no end to his magnificence of spirit, purity, such depth of heart, such tenderness. Yes, Roxanne. And now... And now... Come. And I must die today, knowing that she, unknowing, weeps for him, but mourns for me. The signal! Reinforcements coming! Hang on! On this letter, his blood, his tears, his brave blood, his tender tears. <gasps> De Guiche, get her away! Yes, sir, or no? I'm going to lead the charge. You've proved your valor, Monsieur De Guiche. Now, do what you have to do. Get her away. I'll get her away. If you can hang on here a while, we'll win. Come, Roxanne. Uh, Come. Uh, With me. Oh, we'll see. Goodbye, Roxanne. We're falling back. I could have pas. Trollo. Don't worry. I have two deaths to avenge. Christian, my happiness. They're coming over. Let them fire. 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 Sister Claire admired her new coif in the mirror twice. A lesser sin than an aesthetic error. Very plain. That's one tale. Here's another. Sister Mart is a thief. Oh. Reverend Mother, she stole a plum from the plum pie when the cook had her back turned. It was a very small plum. My look in the mirror was a very small look. Two looks. Monsieur de Bergerac's due to come this evening. It will grieve him to hear of your sins. Please don't do that. You know he'll make fun of us. He'll say that nuns are greedy. Frivolous. Also good. However sternly he begins, he always ends by saying nuns are good. Good. Must be ten or, or a dozen years since he started his Saturday visits. More. He's been visiting us ever since his cousin came here to live. Fifteen years since that sore, sad loss of hers. She brought her widow's weeds, as he puts it, to offset our virgin lilies. He's very poetical. A black dove, he once said, among grounded seagulls. His skill is all in worldly things. Was he ever in love, I wonder? Such a gentleman, yet he leads a very aggressive life. Once he said to me that there's a kind of panache in virgin vows. What did he mean? The white plume of celibacy. He made a rhyme about it. He was always witty. He's the only one who can make her smile. Very droll. He likes our cake, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a pity. He's not a good Catholic. We'll convert him in time. No, I forbid you to meddle with his soul. He may stop coming here. But how about God? Rest easy. God, being omniscient, knows all about Monsieur de Bergerac. There's not one Saturday I haven't heard him say, Ah, oh, dear sister, and in a proud sort of way, too, Dear sister, I ate meat yesterday. Really? I'd be more ready for praise than blame if he was telling the truth. The last time he came, he hadn't eaten for three days. Oh, no. He's poor. Very poor. Who told you so? Monsieur Lebray. Apart from things like prayer, why doesn't somebody help him? Nobody dare. Sister Claire, we'd better go in. She has a visitor. The Comte de Guiche. A long time since he came to call on her. He's busy, I suppose. The court, the camp, the world. A long time, Roxanne. Too long. God knows how you can bring yourself to cheat men's eyes of all that golden beauty. You propose to stay here forever in mourning? Forever. Ever faithful? Faithful. My future lies among the faithful. Have you forgiven me? I'm here. 
That has to mean I have forgiven you. <laughs> Christian, was he really so... If you knew him. I didn't know him. I didn't particularly want to know him. That last letter of his, you still wear it next to you? Still. And forever. Like a sacred relic. I'll never understand such a sterile devotion. But to me, he isn't really dead. It's as if we still meet in some special region, sustained only by love, not devotion, living love. Love between the living. Do you see much of the other man? Cyrano. <laughs> oh, yes. He pays a weekly visit, acts as my gazette, <laughs> my court circular, out on Saturdays. Under that tree, if the weather's fine, they set a chair for him. I wait with my embroidery. At four o'clock, the clock strikes, and on the last stroke, I hear his step and his stick tapping the stone steps. He's so regular. I never turn to see. Sister! Sir Roxanne. Ah, it's Le Bray. Le Bray, how's our friend? Not well. Not well at all. He's exaggerating. It's just as I say. Just as I've always said. Loneliness. Wretchedness. He writes those satires of his, determined to make more and more enemies. He attacks false saints, false nobles, false heroes, plagiaristic poets, in fact, more or less everyone. That's no life for anyone. Everyone goes in terror of that sword of his, that's one thing. No one dares touch him. That may be so. Oh, it isn't the violence, I fear. It's this loneliness, as I said. It's hunger, poverty, ravening December with wolves at its heels, battering the door of his dark hovel. Soon they'll catch our swordsman off his guard. Every day, you know, he has to tighten his belt by one more notch. <laughs> Even his poor old nose isn't the same. It's like discoloured ivory. And he has only one rusty, rotting, black serge coat to his name. This is the world. This is how the world goes. Ah. He takes what comes. Don't pity him too much. He lives his life as he wants. He's one of those rare animals that have opted to be free. Oh, my lord, do you... I know I have everything and he has nothing save that one thing. Nevertheless, I think I'd be proud to shake him by the hand. You know, I think I envy him. Yes, envy him. There's such a thing as success which sickens like excess. When a man wins the big prizes, having no glaring sins to reproach himself with, filling the foreground up, he feels sinful, nevertheless. Defiled from top to toe. Not with remorse. Remorse is too considerable a thing. Rather as though under the silk, under the velvet and ermine, there crawled a vague, disquieting breed of vermin unknown to moral entomologists. Pride bloats to more pride. Power never rests. I must say, the sentiment does you honor. Yes. Le Bray, hmm? uh, permit us a brief word. It's true. No one dares to attack your friend, not openly. But the hate grows, and hate will find its way. I think you ought to warn him. The other day at court, one of his haters said to me, the Bergerac may die accidentally. I see. I hope you see. Tell him to stay at home, to be careful. Careful? Whatever I say, he treads his own path. He's coming here today. All, all right, I'll, I'll warn him, but... For... Madame? Yes, Sister Claire? What is it? There's a man called Ragano would like a word with you. Very well. Bring him to me. Madame? I suppose he's come for sympathy. Something to warm him on his long, cold, downward road. The things he's done. 
pastry cook, poet, singer, bathhouse attendant, actor, <laughs> parish beadle, hairdresser, teacher of guitar. Oh, poor man, his fortune's always in the descendant. What next, I wonder? Dear madame, uh, your grace. First, tell your troubles, if troubles they are, to Monsieur Lebray. But madame. Uh, come, my lord duke, I'll see you on your way. Madame. But madame, I... Oh, well, I, I suppose... Well, after all, I mean, uh, in any case, it's it's not the sort of thing that... Well, not yet, anyway. I, 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 what, man? I went to see him just now. Oh. Our friend, I mean, he... He was just coming out of his lodgings, and I, I hurried on to meet him, but he was walking quickly, and at the corner of the street there's this upper window. He was passing under it. I wonder if it could really have been an accident. I wonder... Oh, anyway, oh, my God, I, a, a servant, a big hairy lout, he, he, he let a chunk of wood drop, a great heavy log fall, fall... On, on top of... Oh, oh, no. It's a massive chunk of wood. Well, what are you trying to tell me? Well, he was lying there. Well, I, I ran up to him as quickly as I could. A, a great gash in his... Dead? He was just about alive. I carried him up to his room. Have you seen it? Oh, I've never seen such squalor. Oh, my God. Is he suffering? I don't think so. I, I don't think he feels anything. Did, did you get a... A, a doctor came, yes, out of, out of charity. What happened? Oh, we mustn't tell Roxanne. She, she mustn't know. Not yet. Oh, oh if you'd seen him... Lying there, blood, bandages. But you will now, of course. Why do we, we? We must go quickly. He's all there by himself. And if he tries to get up, and he will, I know he will. He, he may, he may. We must go to him at once. <laughs> Through the chapel. Yes. That's the shortest way. Yes. Yes. Monsieur Lebray. Going off when I call him. Ragnar, poor man. Must have been unusually pathetic. This last September day makes my old sorrow smile. It's as though April had come to golden maturity, so that the fall is really the fall of spring. Gentle end, mirror of a gentle beginning. So. The last stroke. The hour. This is strange. I was never late before. Perhaps the nun who's always trying to convert him is trying again. Never known him to be as late as this. He ought to be converted by now. Here he is, madame. Monsieur de Bergerac. Late for the first time, Cyrano. After 15 years. Uh, forgive me. Please, I was detained, I'm afraid. Well? By an unexpected visitor. Was it a tiresome visitor? Uh, very tiresome. And you sent him away? For the time being. This is Saturday, I said, and on Saturday I have... A regular engagement. Do me the favor of returning in an hour or so. He'll have to wait some time. I shan't let you go before dark. It's just possible, I'm afraid. I may have to go before it's dark. September. <laughs> and the leaves are falling. Mm, such color. Perfect Venetian red. Mm. They're falling fast. They fall well with a sort of panache. <laughs> they plume down in their last loveliness, disguising their fear of being dried and pounded to ash to mix with the common dust. They go in grace, making their fall appear like flying. <laughs> You're melancholy today. Never, I'm not the melancholy sort. Very well, then. Well, let the leaves of the fall fall while you turn the leaves of my gazette. <laughs> What's new at court? Uh, let me see, let me see. Saturday the 19th, His Majesty was ill after eating too much preserved ginger. <laughs> <laughs> Eight <laughs> helpings, to be precise. Uh, what next? Oh, yes, uh, Sunday the 20th. The Queen gave us a great ball and they burned... 1,763 oh. wax candles. A, a minor item. Uh, our army, so it's learned, has been victorious in Austria. Mm. 
uh, Madame Datiste's dog, a sort of hairy, a smaller Madame Datiste, was given an animal. Oh, Monsieur de Bergerac, that will do. Monday the 21st, nothing. Tuesday the uh, 22nd, the entire court removed to Fontainebleau. Wednesday. Oh. Ah, ah. Yes, uh, what? Uh, what is it? Yes, what is it? it? It's nothing, nothing at all. I shall be all right. Just my old wound from Arras. It likes to sting <laughs> sometimes to remind me that it's still there. Oh, my poor dear friend. It, it, it doesn't last. It will go soon. There. It, it's gone. Oh. We all of us have our old wounds. Mine is here on yellowing paper, blood stained, tear stained, hardly legible. His letter. Didn't you say that one day you'd let me read it? You want to? You really want to? Yes. Today. Now. Take it then. I may open it? Open it. Read it. Goodbye, Roxanne, for this is the last time I shall be able to write. Allow. I have to die sometime today. My beloved, how heavy my heart is, and it is heavy too, with so great a burden of love, love still untold, perhaps unguessed at, unprospected gold from love's new world, not to be mined, for now the time for its shining forth is gone. All gone. Never more shall my eyes kiss the sight of you, the flight of your gestures. I think of one, the way you have of pushing back a strand of your hair from your forehead, and my heart wants to cry out. You read it. You read it in such a way. But now I can only cry. Goodbye, my dearest. It's such a voice. Goodbye, my angel, my heart's treasure, my one love. A voice, I know. I'm, I'm not hearing for the first time speaking such words. Never for one second has my heart been absent from your presence. And as the night deepens, the shadows of the next world start to close in on me. I shall be that one whose love raging and blessing like the sun that outlives all men will live on and on beyond the sun's limits. How can you possibly read now in this lack of light? For all of fifteen years you have played the role of the old friend. Affectionate, droll, but never one hint of... Roxanne. So it was you. Oh, no. Roxanne, no, no. I might have known every time you spoke my name. Not I. Oh, no. It was you. Roxanne, I swear. I see through it all now. That generous imposture, the, the letters, it was you. No. It was always you, the mad, dear, foolish words. No. The voice in the night. You. Upon my honour. It was all... And always you. I never loved you. You loved me. It was he who loved you. Even now you love me. No. That no is not so strong as it was a second or two ago. No, no, my dear love. I never loved you. And all these fifteen long years, while you stayed silent, you knew... You knew that his letter was stained by your tears, not his... His blood, though, stained by his blood. And you never said, you never hinted, never once. Why do you break silence now? Oh, because I... Oh, this will I... be your last madness. How could you be so more? He's here, I know. Yes, indeed, I am here. You ought to know, madame. That he's killed himself to come to you. Oh, my God, that fakeness. I wanted... I regret that I rudely intermitted my gazette. On Saturday, the 26th, an hour before dinner, Monsieur de Bergerac was foully, ignobly murdered. Oh, no, what have they done to you? At Arras, I said I wanted to depart with honourable steel piercing my heart and a piercing epigram upon my lips. That's what I said. <laughs> But fate's a great buffoon, a balloon pricker, a deflator of the most stoic 
postures. A specialist in traps and trips. Look at me, ambushed, taken in the rear in a gutter for a battlefield. My heroic foe, a scullion, his weapon a mere fire log. My life has played a consistent tune. I've missed everything, even my death. Oh, monsieur. Don't blubber, Ragano, my fellow poet. Poets should be dry-eyed, cease your <laughs> sobs. And tell me what you're writing these days. Oh, nothing. All I do is odd menial jobs for Molière. Oh, Molière. Yes. But I'm leaving the swine tomorrow. Yesterday, they played Scapin, his new comedy. He's stolen a whole scene from you. I could murder him. When a poet has taste, he can show it by stealing from his betters. I gather his play's a success. Well, you see, it was. The audience laughed. At last. At last. <laughs> My life. All of a piece. A shaft of sun, a puff of air, and then not even a memory. Roxanne, do you recall that night? The balcony, the ivied wall, Christian... I stood in the shadows underneath and left it to another to climb and claim the kiss of glory. It happened again and again. The shadow for me, for others, the applause, the fame. There's a kind of justice somewhere, even in the teeth of what's to come, I can say. Gentlemen, take down this truism in your commonplace books. Moliere has genius. Christian had good luck. The nuns are going to pray now. Nymphs in thy orisons, etc., etc. Sister! <laughs> Sister! No, no, don't go away. When you come back, I may not be here. <coughs> A little defunctive music, that's all I need now. You must live. I love you. Don't say that. That doesn't come into the story. When the princess said, I love you, to the enchanted prince, who was a toad or something, all his ugliness melted away under the sunlight of those words. Your magic doesn't work. Love, you say, but as you see, I'm still the same. How can I forgive myself? It's I who have done this to you. Let no shred of blame cling to your silk. I never had much acquaintance with the sweetness of woman. My mother was, understandably perhaps, not pleased with what she'd produced. I had no sister. Later in manhood I learned to fear the mistress with mockery in the tail of her eye. But, and God bless you for this forever and ever, I have had one friend different from the few others. A friend in a silken gown in my life. There's another friend just come out. The moon. I see her. I never loved but one man in my life. Now I must lose him twice. The Bray, I shall mount soon to that opaline presence. Plunge into that crystalline river or lake of light without a lunar machine or astral rocket. No, no, I won't have it. It's stupid, it's unjust. Such a poet, such a great heart, such a man. To die like this, to die like this. There he goes, growling, my old bear, Lebray. My dear, dear. We are the Gascony cadets, uh, <gasps> Captain Castel Jaloux. Oh, no. I have to leave you. Sorry, I can't stay. That lunar shaft is waiting to carry me away. A punctual and impatient sort of engine. I would not ask that you mourn any the less that good, brave Christian, blessed with handsomeness. But when the final cold sniffs at my heart and licks my bones, perhaps you might impart a double sense to your long obsequies and make those tears which have been wholly his mine too, just a little. Mine, just a little, <laughs> my love. No. Death, not here, oh, no, not lying down! 
Let no one try to help me. He's coming. <laughs> He's coming. Already I feel myself being shod in marble, gloved in lead. <laughs> Let him come then. He shall find me on my feet. My sword in my hand. Cyrano. There he is, looking at me, grinning at my nose. Who is he to grin, that noseless one? Huh? What's that you say? Useless? Useless? You have it wrong, you empty brain pan. You see, a man fights for far more than the mere hope of winning. Better, far better, to know that the fight is totally, irreparably, incorrigibly in vain. A hundred against... No, a thousand! And I recognize every one, every one of you. <laughs> All my old enemies, falsehood, compromise, prejudice, cowardice. You ask for my surrender? Ah, no, never, no, never. Are you there too, stupidity? <laughs> You, above all others, perhaps, were predestined to get me in the end, but no, I'll fight on, fight on, fight. You take everything, the rose and the laurel too, take them and welcome, but in spite of you, there is one thing goes with me when tonight, I enter my last lodging, sweeping the bright stars from the blue threshold with my salute. A thing unstained, unsullied by the brute, broken nails of the world, by death, by doom, unfingered. See it there, a white plume over the battle, a diamond. In the ash of the ultimate combustion. Oh, my love. My only love. My panache. In Cyrano de Bergerac by Edmond Rostin, translated by Anthony Burgess, Cyrano was played by Kenneth Branagh. Roxanne, Jody May. Comte de Guiche, John Shrapnel. Christian de Nevillette, Tom Hiddleston. Ragano, Jimmy Yule. Montfleury, Stephen Critchlow. Belle Rose, Hugh Dixon. Lebray, Gerard Horan. Carbon and Quigi, by John McAndrew. Liniere, Steve Hodson. Valver, Oliver Lesueur. The Duenna and Marked, Francis Jeter. Mother Superior, Susan Jameson. Sister Claire, Joanna Tinsey. The technical presentation was by Norman Goodman. The play was adapted for radio by John Tiderman and directed by David Timson. The producer of Cyrano de Bergerac was Nicholas Soames, and it was a new Kemi production for BBC Radio 3.